OK, defusing the time bomb. Um, the obesity time bomb, that is. Much in the news today with reports of a campaign by the medical profession to look for research and experience of actions and strategies that work in preventing or reducing obesity. Um, this photo of Olympic staff delivering soft drinks to the uh, Olympic Aquatic Centre led the Guardian newspaper's report on the campaign, uh, published on Saturday, launched by the medical profession to combat what the medical profession describes as the single greatest public health threat in the UK, rising levels of child and adult obesity. obesity. As described by the Guardian, the campaign is bold, demanding, for example, an end for what it calls to irresponsible marketing by major food and drink firms. It also calls on the government to ditch the responsibility to deal with the food industry, describing it as inherently flawed. Um, the BBC also picked up on the story, uh, again emphasising issues around the sponsorship of sport by fast food companies. Um, this obviously links to issues around the Marmot Report, the responsibility deal and public health in general. I'm not going to attempt to review the issues in detail here. I just plan to talk a bit around uh, the landscape and have a look at a few relevant questions. Uh, the campaign has been organised in the umbrella of the Academy of Royal Medical Colleges and includes health professionals from surgeons and psychiatrists to paediatricians and GP. Academy spokesperson man, uh, Professor Stevenson, who's reported in the BBC article, is saying that allowing companies such as Coca-Cola and McDonald's to sponsor the London 2012 Olympics sends the wrong message. They clearly wouldn't be spending the money if they didn't benefit from being associated with successful athletes. Um, that's one of a number of quotes which I'm, I'm going to read out. Uh, it has to be said the Academy's own material published on their website doesn't go quite that far. Um, the campaign will start with a three month or six month, depending where you uh, read which paper you read, and I suspect six months is probably more close to the actual truth. Evidence gathering exercise involving a range of stakeholders, which will include public health professionals, local authorities, education providers, charities, campaign groups, and the public. Uh, the idea of the exercise is to look for research and experience of actions and strategies that work in reducing or preventing obesity. Um, these are areas of action from the Guardian the article mentioned a bit earlier on. Uh, they're taken from an interview with, again, the Academy's Vice President, Professor Stevenson. Um, they aren't in the Academy's own material. Um, OK, we're going to skip over whether there's any distinction between celebrities and cartoon characters these days and think a bit more about the substantive issues. As I mentioned, these aren't included in the material published by the Academy. Um, so I suspect there may be the journalists speculating what conclusions the evidence gathering phase might come to. Um, try your own conclusions about whether it was done just to spice up the story and whether these are straw men that might serve to distract attention from the issues. The Academy does talk about five key areas. Include action to be taken by individuals such as diet, exercise and responsible parenting. Um, it's worth mentioning, of course, that this is a multifactorial issue. These areas don't exist in isolation from each other. In the BBC article, Professor Stevenson said, for example, he did not think society could simply exercise its way out of the problem of obesity. I'm quoting, My own personal experience is you have to exercise a huge amount to lose weight. I would, I would have to run on a treadmill at maximum speed for an hour to counter effect the effect from the calories of one or two Mars bars. Uh, end quote. Uh, the environment includes advertising, food labelling, sponsorship, the built environment, local authority policies and facilities, etc. Um, as I discussed in the Marmot Report update, many key public health functions are moving the local authorities and indeed the food industry under the responsibility deal. Um, OK, I'm not, this is a, a shot of Linthorpe Road, obviously. I'm not particularly picking on THC or perfect chicken. But anyone who walks down Linthorpe Road or any similar road in a major town will be aware aware that most of the shops that are still open are now fast food outlets. Um, clinical interventions are unsurprisingly those made by clinicians. Uh, it's a bit outside the scope of these comments, so I'll pass quickly on to the pasty tax. Um, fiscal measures include taxation, uh, the possibility of minimum pricing, and corporate and financial, uh, corporate and personal incentives. 
Um, this picture of an innocent child about to have a pasty torn from her grasp is from an article in the Guardian's Northerner blog. Gosh, the Guardian being patronising out the North, who would have imagined that? Anyway, as you will remember, in the recent budget, the council has slapped 20% VAT on food sold above ambient temperature. This caused a certain amount of fuss, um, worldwide actually. Uh, the New York Times took an interest in the controversy, noting that the posh Chancellor of the Exchequer couldn't remember the last time he partook of a pasty. Uh, the article described the pasty as being a calorie-busting meat pie, um, perhaps they meant calorie-bursting, and I do feel the need to point out that you can't get cheese and veggie varieties, but I digress. Um, it, it caused a bit of a few rows, I say, and it was mostly around uh, increased cost and uh, you know penalising people who don't have a lot of money. Um, the point I want to make here is that uh, although proposed for reasons that seem to have little to do with health, um, this tax increase might be a foretaste of reaction to something such as a fat tax, or a salt tax, or a sugar tax. Um, as fat tax, of course, has been famously introduced in Denmark. Uh, which I have to say rather begs the question, where was the medical profession during the recent pasty tax tumult? One would assume they would have been strongly in favour. Uh, finally, we come to education as delivered by and in nurseries, schools, further higher education and through public information campaigns. Sure Start Centre is an obviously good example, uh, being a key initiative for, focused on improving childcare, education and health, uh, the UK programme beginning in 1998 and was based on the American Head Start programme. Um, the latest figures show that there were 3,507 Sure Start Centres in September 2011 compared to 3,631 in April 2010 a reduction of 124 um, so far. School Food Trust is another good initiative, set up in 2005, following the publicity aroused by Jamie Oliver's, Oliver's critique of the nutritional quality of school meals in his TV documentary series, Jamie's School Dinners. Uh, their education activities include Let's Get Cooking, this operates through, through 5,000 Let's Get Cooking, clubs for children, young people, their families and the wider community where people can learn new cooking skills and the benefits of eating good food that is good for you. Other initiatives, initiatives from the SFT have included guides for caterers for calculating the nutrition content of meals and practical advice on meeting the standards. I've not looked specifically to say here, if you're interested, have a dig in the SFT website. It is an excellent resource. Um, okay, this is a call back to the very first lecture in year one. Um, go to this URL if you want to listen to the audio recording again. This is of an interview with representatives from Local Authority Caterers Association and the School Foods Trust. The Caterers Association representative was somewhat worried about iron and zinc, um, as you can see. Luckily, the representative from the School Foods Trust was able to put the nation's fears at rest. There really is no need to force feed children liver and spinach. I quite like spinach myself. Um, for example, pointing out that the guidelines aim to balance nutrition over a three-week period and include many uh, nutritional and tasty uh, suggestions, such as such as this, which doesn't contain any offal but does contain a lot of iron and zinc. Um, this section on the school food trust went on a bit longer than I anticipated mainly because it's um, threat's probably not quite the right word but I'm going to use it it's under threat from a number of quarters uh, the incumbent government moved the school food trust from being an arm of government to being a charity uh, this may not necessarily be a bad thing and was we wel welcomed by the trust it has to be said um, and there is something to be said for independence there's also something to be said for proper funding of a national priority of course um, other changes which are perhaps been less well reported have involved the ending of the school meal grant as a separate source of funding. This grant was ring fenced to upgrade menus and dining areas. Uh, the money will still be there, sort of, but will not be protected. Um, also, Michael Gove, the Education Secretary, has proposed that academy schools are exempted from the national standards for nutrition in schools. Academies currently teach almost 1.2 million pupils in this country. 
Um, not everyone was disappointed or downhearted, has to be said. Way back in 2010, when the cuts were first being mooted, um, private sector consultants were queuing up to say what a good thing they thought this was. I'm not going to quote for them. Read the article yourself, and as ever, make your own mind up based on the evidence, hopefully. Okay, as I said, I've gone a little bit longer about the FSFT than I intended. I just want to end this section by commenting on their rather good evidence base. They produce a number of well-researched reports, including this one on the uptake of school meals in England. Well worth reading if you're interested in this area. Um, as I've said a number of times uh, in here and other places, policy should be based on evidence. And it looks to me like the SFT has been a success. OK, advertising. Um, there's a lot of it about, and a lot of it is linked to sport, including, for example, the Cadbury's Cream Egg Olympics. Um, these big companies. Um, Budweiser, for example, is the official beer of the World Cup. Uh, whether sports should be sponsored by alcohol companies like alone sold at grounds are not arguments I'm going to get into here. Um, during the World Cup in Germany in 2006, all the other beers were banned from Stadia, apart from Budweiser, which was interesting. Uh, German beer is protected by purity laws dating back to 1516, which limits the definition of beer to a product uh, whose ingredients are yeast, barley, water and hops. Since rice is a key ingredient in the American Budweiser, uh, it would appear to have been excluded. It has to be said German laws have been watered down, uh, sorry about that, in the 1980s to allow imported beers, but the fact that this was the only beer that was uh, mandated to be sold in World Cup Stadium did cause a bit of a fuss. Uh, amid cries of its Spulwasser, uh, which apparently means dishwater, which may be not what you thought it meant, a compromise was reached, allowing the local beer to be sold in unmarked beakers. It is reported of outsold bud by a rather large margin. Um, undeterred, the FIFA confirmed bud as its official beer, uh, and for the World Cup uh, forthcoming in uh, 2014 in Brazil. This is despite a law in beer banning the sale of alcohol in all the country's stadiums. FIFA General Secretary Jerome Valkers' remarks quoted by the BBC uh, make interesting reading and suggest the scale of the issue in disconnecting alcohol from sport. I'm quoting directly from the article here. Quote, Alcoholic drinks are part of the FIFA World Cup, so we're going to have them. Excuse me if I sound a bit arrogant, but that's something we won't negotiate. Uh, OK, moving on. Um, closer to home, the Football League Cup is sponsored by Carling. Um, it's had many sponsors in its day, including the Milk Marketing Board, uh, Milk's High in Calcium. Uh, so the amount of ridicule which uh, those of us of a certain age may remember that was heaped on the Milk Cup back then was a little bit unfair. Uh, people noted that as the cup was solid, there was no way to pull the celebratory milk, for example. Um, uh, odd sponsorship deals do remind me of this, and this is completely irrelevant. The home dugout at Ayrson Park was once sponsored by Dialer Duck. The famous scrapyard, which had lots of iron, though none of it nutritionally relevant. OK, that's all. Thanks for listening.